The Quad Cities Chamber of Commerce is the platinum sponsor of this tribute to the 150th anniversary of the Rock Island Arsenal, celebrating its major socioeconomic importance to the Quad Cities region. There hereby is established a national arsenal at Columbus in the state of Ohio, at Indianapolis in the state of Indiana, and on Rock Island in the state of Illinois for the deposit and repair of arms and other munitions of war. Abraham Lincoln, 1862. The charming island of Rock Island, three miles long and half a mile wide, belongs to the United States and the government has turned it into a wonderful park, enhancing its natural attractions by art and threading its fine forests with many miles of drives. Near the center of the island, one catches glimpses through the trees of 10 vast stone four-story buildings, each of which covers an acre of ground. These are the government workshops for the Rock Island establishment is a national armory and arsenal. Mark Twain, 1883. With Lincoln's signature in 1862, the Rock Island arsenal was officially born. But 1862 wasn't the start of the island's complex history. Ever since Lieutenant Zebulon Pike first reported about the island in 1805, it has been central to the growth of both the United States and the Quad Cities area. After the War of 1812, Fort Armstrong was built, and, and primarily to keep an eye on Black Hawk uh, and the Sac and Fox tribes that were here. But that security that the military created in the area uh, both in the local community and up and down the riverway, allowed you know, new people to come in. The settlers came in. The settlers started coming in in the late 1820s uh, as land was surveyed. Well, then John Deere comes in soon after that because of the water power, but also the security that's being provided by Fort Armstrong and the military presence. Uh, and, and so then as you go beyond that, it becomes this employer uh, that, that hires the uh, largest employer in the area during the 1860s and 70s, 80s. And again today, the federal government being the largest employer of the area, that continues today, is that all the people who live around us, you know, and I say around us because I live in the community as well, and we all live in our communities and come to work every day, uh, and then we go back. So the arsenal, I mean, it still does bind, I think, the both sides of the river together. Even before Pike, and long before Colonel Thomas J. Rodman designed the iconic stone shops and quarters won in the late 1860s, the great sock warrior, Black Hawk, understood the island's strategic and emotional importance. We did not, however, try to prevent their building the fort on the island, but we were very sorry, as this was the best island on the Mississippi and had long been the resort of our young people during the summer. It was our garden which supplied us with strawberries, blackberries, plums, apples, and nuts of various kinds, and its water supplied us with pure fish, being situated in the rapids of the river. In my early life I spent many happy days on this island. Blackhawk, 1834 The reason for the arsenal here was for a decision that the Army didn't really make and didn't agree with, and that decision was run uh, by George Davenport and the Chicago Rock Island Railway Company. They wanted to throw a bridge across the river uh, right here. In 1850 or so, this was the only place where the water was narrow enough uh, that the technology of the day could actually throw a bridge across. And so they had to bounce from Rock Island to the island and over to Davenport to do that. Uh, the Secretary of War opposed that. Uh, he was trying to get a southern route across for a transcontinental uh, rail line. Uh, so what the uh, Chicago Rock Island Railroad lawyers figured out was that the government had never deeded the land. And if they hadn't deeded it, it was part of Illinois. And Illinois granted the license. And then Illinois had, and Iowa had already granted the license. So they, they, they bounced across the river here. Well, this makes Rock Island, Davenport, Moline, the transportation hub of the United States. Everything came through here because they started building the rail line to Omaha next 
Uh, and during the Civil War, they started building the Transcontinental Link, which was finished in 1867. So everything going east to west came through Rock Island and Davenport. And then you had the, all the water traffic. So this was a multimodal uh, transportation hub. When the Army starts looking for an arsenal for the west, because they were thinking already that we're going to have combat in the west with the Indi Native American tribes, um, they were looking for the right place to put that, and it was the transportation network that drew them here. So that's why they decided to build the arsenal here in 1860-61, and why Congress finally de deeded the land in 1862, which is what we count the birthday, the 150th, 150th birthday of the arsenal, is when we deeded the land in 1862. So that, that one decision, which the Army opposed, because they didn't want a bridge across this piece here, is really what drove the ability to have the arsenal here and then have that coast-to-coast -coast reach which has been, I think, important to that its longevity is able to serve the Army across the country because it's in the middle of the country. I have no doubt that the very soul of every man and woman at Rock Island Arsenal is wrapped up in every gun, every tool, and every piece of equipment that is turned out. When the final chapter is written in the history of this terrible conflict, no one will have more honor than the workers of Rock Island Arsenal. When peace is declared, each one of you who has played such a vital part in the settlement will be able to take inventory of himself and say conscientiously, I have done my bit. The Honorable A. F. Dawson, 1918. One thing I want to make clear is that, is that uh, while a military installation, the population here has always been primarily civilian employees of the Army with a very small top level of, of military managing that. Those civilians, time and time again, we see from what's left behind the record, is that they absolutely understood that they were critical to the soldier being able to do their job wherever the war was. Because when the war was declared, I was, doing, I was on the floor doing my homework, and it came on the radio that there was War. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. And my dad my says, oh boy, boy, there goes my boy. My mom went in the kitchen and she was crying. And I thought, boy, this, what is this? This is serious, you know, this is bad. So right from then on, I wanted to help the war effort and, and get our boys back home. But really from the Spanish American War on, they knew that they were critical to deploying the army. Uh, down to Cuba and then cross over to, uh, to the Philippines. And World War I, boy, this place exploded and those people understood and they became a family, which I find very interesting. Uh, both World War I and World War II, uh, the record is full of baseball teams and socials and theater groups uh, that, that all did after duty work together. So they came here and they worked for eight or 10 or 12 hours, but they also socialized together as well and they seemed to become a, a big family, but always focused uh, on what was going on with the soldier. Oh, I wanted to do more. I wanted to go to the uh, armed forces and do something, but I wasn't old enough. So I did the next best thing. I went to work and I helped make the guns and, and ship them overseas and do, I made labels and did my part like that, try to get that war ended and get the boys back because I was 16 when I started and there were no boys. Our graduating class was just mothers of the boys that were in their service, and girls. The water power available at that place and the communication by water and by railroads projected on in course of construction concur with other circumstances in rendering Rock Island one of the most advantageous sites in the whole western country for an armory or an arsenal of construction for the manufacture of wagons, clothing, or other military supplies. 
Jefferson Davis, Secretary of War, 1854. Strategically important because originally had skills that nobody else had. Over time, when we got into World War II, strategically critical because it was centered in the heart of the country and could, it could go to both coasts and overseas from both the coasts. Um, today, I think it's strategically critical because uh, of the fact that we have loaded all this office complex that I mentioned before. Our, our high-level logistics managers that see the Army's readiness and, and its new equipment uh, in a centralized core right here and we are able to reach out around the world from the central location. Uh, the command, Army Sustainment Command, has got a brigade in Korea, has a unit in Germany, has a unit in Afghanistan, has a unit in Kuwait, and it seems kind of funny today with modern technology, but that allows us from the center of the country and the sort of the center of the world to re reach around and grab all of our units at the same time with, with all those time zones involved, and we can still reach you know, around the world that way and, and manage the whole Army's global logistics mission. What's, what's really neat about the Army Sustainment Command here at Rock Island is that if a soldier in the field, if they eat it, if they wear it, if they drive it, if they fly it, it comes, it's facilitated by organizations controlled by Army Sustainment Command here on this post. The arsenal is, is, is the Army's, or the, the, the nation's largest machine shop. That plant across the street still manufactures things that no one else can make. Uh, armor for vehicles or, or tool kits and, and can do anything from making two or three small items to making a huge multi-million part production run and that also flexibility because they can they can make something very small and precise or or have the ability to, to run through a production line schedule for something big and in a large quantity so again flexibility makes makes the plant itself important that's what keeps its longevity and I think that's what the army uh, needs to keep an arsenal like this uh, in, in play Well, I think the arsenal is a uh, huge national capability. Uh, it's proven for, for the past 150 years that they have uh, supporting our wars on a regular basis. So uh, they, they fabricate uh, defense equipment for our soldiers. I was a recipient of those type of equipment when I traveled to Iraq in my one year's uh, uh, command there. And it saves lives. So the arsenal is a key player in providing equipment to save soldiers' lives uh, during our wars. The average citizen, the average soldier doesn't even in the Army doesn't know what the arsenal provides. But the arsenal provides uh, enormous capability of, of providing sustainment to the, to the soldiers. Uh, when we first went in Iraq, we were having grenades tossed into the turrets. Uh, we had some soldiers that actually died and, and one soldier won a Medal of Honor for jumping on a grenade to save his friends. That Frag 7 kit adds the overhead protection so that as we go through the, the streets of Afghanistan now and, and then Iraq, that if they throw a grenade, it hits the, the overhead protection and rolls off the, the, the Humvee. So it's a lifesaver. It was a game changer for the soldier that actually rode in those Humvees. Every regular ordnance officer has a deep personal affection for our six old line arsenals and their civilian personnel. Those of us who have known and served with such fine men as Mr. William Bombeck superintendent of Rock Island Arsenal, cannot help feeling great admiration and respect for these great craftsmen. We have studied in these arsenals, worked in their shops, and learned from master craftsmen the secrets of one of the most highly specialized professions in the world. Lieutenant General L. H. Campbell, Jr., Chief of Army Ordnance, World War II. You know, you always kind of wonder when you're standing here in the arsenal and the people across the river kind of look over here and they wonder what goes on over there. Well, what goes on over here is these are a lot of people working for not only the nation, but they work for the community. I mean, these are fathers and sons and mothers, aunts and uncles, grandfathers. These are people who are really interested in the community. And I think all the communities have to realize that the arsenal is an integral part of this entire nation and this community. Well, the Quad Cities would uh, look completely different without the Rock Island Arsenal. Not only is it, uh, you know, a central to our support of uh, the nation's defense and, and uh, all of our support for the work of the military, and it's actually the number one employment site in the whole Quad Cities. And so more people go to work on the arsenal, uh, either in military uh, roles or as members of the civilian force than any other single place in the Quad Cities. So it's a, a huge driver of our economy 
And uh, I think more important to that, it's a huge driver of the technology and the advancements in innovation that are really helping to inspire the private sector industries that are central to the Quad City economy as well. As you walk past all these buildings where my ancestors worked and they had a hand in building them, it's almost like they're reaching out and they kind of draw you in. It is getting, it gets emotional and you, you wonder, you know, uh, how, how was it when they were here? Did they have the same interests that I did? Uh, did uh, some of the skills and crafts that they had passed down to me? I says he was a master carpenter and I do woodworking as a Harvey. So I just wonder, you know, they're still there and they still call out to you.